Southeast and Appalachian Regional Conference. Just thumbs up if you can hear me, making sure my mic's live. Yep, good. And uh, appreciate everybody making it back and spending a Saturday with us. Um, and you are in the right place uh, for the uh, outreach track and the engagement track where the, the next talk is conservative outreach and engagement. Um, and a couple of quick housekeeping rules. All lines are gonna be muted. Um, if you want, if you have a question there, we're gonna try and have some time for questions at the back. Please chat your question to Ask Me Andrea um, in the uh, chat. And uh, the slides for this presentation will be available. There's a bunch of maps and pieces in it that all have links in the notes for each of the, the images that you see. And if you go to the Conservative Caucus Action Team page, scroll all the way down to the bottom, uh, uh, for the presentations and click there, you can find it into the presentations for regional conferences. I have the pleasure of speaking to you this afternoon on conservative outreach. I'm Jim Tolbert and I am your conservative outreach director. I've been on staff now for three years trying to assure that uh, CCL is a friendly place for conservatives as well as progressives and that we recruit, retain and activate conservatives across our organization. Um, and I have my email there. Uh, if your questions don't come up in the chat, that email will be at the end also. Please do feel free to, to uh, email. It's a very simple email to remember, just james.tolbert at citizensclimate.org. I do have three main points I'm going to try and cover today. Um, one is, is as we're doing outreach to conservatives um, to describe an appropriate vision of our energy future, as thinking of that as a key element in your messaging to conservatives when you're engaging with conservatives on climate. Um, think about the, the energy future that you're articulating and, just, and, and conversing with them. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, second point will be crafting your message to connect with the conservative audience's views. So as you're reaching out to conservatives, make sure you're crafting your message in a way that's uh, digestible to them. And a final point will be uh, to look at state teams as a constructive way for us to organize on conservative outreach. Um, so I'm going to first focus on this, this uh, initial point, describing an appropriate vision of our energy future. And, and just a little touching on, uh, we have a lot of training out there. Um, if you go on the community of, and look for training on conservative outreach, you can find some of our training on Jonathan Haidt's work. Uh, where we, we really understand, oh, there's a lot of good work in this as well as our own experience, that people that are far to the right of center hold different values on average than people that are far to the left of center. And as you're engaging with conservatives, you need to be aligning the message that you have with the values of the audience that you're speaking to. Um, and in the Southeast, uh, I, I just want to uh, start with a quick summary saying, so these are the, the states that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I'm going to come back to this map, looking at it from a bunch of different angles on our energy future. Um, so as we're speaking to conservatives, uh, one of the things you want to be able to lay out for them is a reasonable belief, reasonable belief that what you're talking about is an energy future where our lights are still on, we don't have rolling blackouts, and we can still drive to the grocery store. Um, and many, many people on the right start hearing climate messages as restrictions and less and doing less with less. And, and um, a, a good message, a uh, good way to approach part of your message to conservative audiences is to figure out what is the optimistic vision of an energy future that you see with climate change policy in place. Um, so focusing specifically on our region, um, oops, come on, part of this slide is unable to load. Well, that's disappointing. Um, <laughs> so this one was on our nuclear, um, let me just go this way and see if I can go backwards. That. No, it's not, it's not going to load. So when we look at the nuclear uh, footprint, uh, where we have it in the United States, um, if you look at the top 12 um, states that rely on, on over 30% of their energy from nuclear, six of those are in our region. We have a very heavy nuclear footprint region, and that is not even including Florida and Georgia, which also have a good nuclear footprint. Um, so if you are in those six states, if you're in most of the states in our region, it is beneficial for you to be able to understand the nuclear industry and nuclear power some and speak about it in a constructive, 
positive, encouraging fashion, even if you don't think that you want nuclear to be part of the final solution and you may want to shift away from nuclear. Um, there are a lot of good arguments about base load capacity and the ability to keep the lights on when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining that resonate very well with conservative audiences. So I really strongly suggest if you're in the Southeast for most states, you verse yourself in an ability to speak positively about nuclear power or direct them towards some people that can speak positively about nuclear power. And my two exceptions are the two states with absolutely zero nuclear energy in our, in our region, and that is Kentucky and West Virginia. Um, so Kentucky and West Virginia have no nuclear energy. Um, and part of the reason I'm walking, I'm gonna walk through a bunch of different energy technologies is to really stress as you are in your own local region, know your audience and develop a map of an energy future that can resonate with your local audience as well as uh, that you can present. Um, so building out an ability to speak positively about nuclear in all of the states in our region except West Virginia and Kentucky is an important piece. Even there it can be important, but recognize they have no investment in nuclear in West, we have no investment in nuclear in West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, so oftentimes when we're speaking about energy, uh, we, we it, oftentimes it is easy for people that are uh, concerned about climate to speak about renewables, really quickly go over to renewables um, and a step after the make sure you keep nuclear in that conversation is to have a real discussion about uh, renewables. Um, so this is a National Renewable Energy Lab map for wind power where the, the, the average wind velocity at 100 meters, which is kind of a substitute for where can you put a wind farm, the darker the blue, the higher the average wind velocity is at 100 meters, and the more valuable a wind turbine is uh, that we put up now that are very high. And what you'll notice is if you think about where there are a lot of wind turbines in our country, many people will think about accurately, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, up into Iowa, like those are really good wind areas. Uh, but there are also a lot of wind farms like into Ohio, if you've driven uh, uh, up the freeway uh, towards, towards Michigan and Ohio. Um, but the, in the Southeast region, we don't have on land in general as good of wind potential. The two exceptions I really want to point out is one is some of the mountaintop wind potential, which is extreme. There's some very good potential there that people they may not be very excited to say, we want to see wind turbines on the top of our most majestic peaks. Um, but those, there are some very real possibilities there. And the other very large point uh, that I want to train our volunteers in is in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, our offshore wind potential is real and significant. Uh, we have a shallow sloping coast. And when you look at the map, we have very good wind potential there. And, and we should be bringing that up as part of our optimistic vision of the future and be able to direct people to maps like this. Um, solar power is another one that uh, plays out differently across our region. Um, in the south, uh, from the Carolinas and Tennessee south, we have excellent solar potential, not quite as good as over in, in the uh, arid west. Uh, this is a solar potential that includes cloud cover if from NREL again, the, 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 the links are in the, uh, the, the notes for these if you download the slides. As you get up into Kentucky and West Virginia and Pennsylvania, um, that potential goes down, uh, but still has some very real options there. So this really comes into play of building out your own personalized message, depending on who your audience is, but making sure you can present an optimistic view of what does this look like to turn away from emitting, fossil, emitting CO2 into the air. Um, and, and another uh, piece that uh, many of us are very familiar with speaking about uh, is, is hydroelectric. Our dams have been in place for a long time, and this is base load uh, electricity that has been with us for uh, 50 years. This, this map is color coded by when the uh, hydroelectric plants were installed. Um, and many of our states have, have a solid contribution here. Uh, and this is without the pump storage, uh, pump storage maps. Um, again, the, the links are in there from EIA on this one and you can also get maps on where the pump storage is. Um, but the message I, I really wanna drive home here is, is looking at the audience you're going to be speaking to and making sure you can present 
a vision for them of where our energy is going to come from. And the second piece that goes with that is a vision for how your community, the community you're speaking to, is going to get through this transition. Um, you know, most of us understand that open burning of coal with emissions into the atmosphere is a big part of our problem right now, um, and we need to move away from that. Uh, this is coal production in the United States as of 2019, again, Energy, Innovation, Energy Information Administration, and uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Kentucky have significant contributions here. Um, we often are motivated by the fact that climate change is going to impact people's lives. I hear that a lot. I think it's a very good phrase. I think I'm concerned because climate change is going to impact people's lives. I think we need to have, when you're speaking to conservative audiences in Pennsylvania, West Virginia and Kentucky, you need a second statement that comes out just as quickly and just as earnestly. Declines in coal production impact people's lives. Um, this looks at our total U.S. coal production in the United States. You can see that it peaked in 2008, important date, remember that for the next slide, and has been dropping significantly since then. Um, and 2020 is going to be even lower. We're close, we're, we are moving away from coal-fired power plants. The coal-fired power plants are about as old as our hydroelectric fleet of plants and are being uh, are in need of significant work. And the most economical uh, decision right now in most cases is to shut down the coal plant and build a natural gas plant in its place um, or put in other sources of energy uh, but you, the, deploy, the, the ability to deploy is such a critical piece, natural gas is, is being prevalent in this switch. So I mentioned 2008 was our peak coal production. Another overlaying factor on um, people's lives in coal country that uh, is good to bring up also is that even with uh, trying to continue coal production, the jobs that we used to know in these communities are not coming back. Uh, this is from the Federal Reserve looking at uh, total coal mining employment in the United States um, from 1986. And you notice that the peak is nowhere near 2008. We were losing coal jobs long before we started shifting away from coal through mechanization. Um, we know how to, coal companies know how to mine coal with a lot less employees now. Um, so even uh, if we were to try and bring back coal, it would not bring back the, the economies of our, of our forefathers in some of these regions. Um, and this is another piece uh, that is important to be able to, to articulate in these regions while still stressing that declines in coal production do impact people's lives, and we need to be considering that while we're looking at climate policy. And for just another the stat for our region, this is when we're looking at where are these declines in coal production. This is uh, coal mining employment uh, by region. The Appalachian region has been hit particularly hard uh, in comparison to the Western uh, Wyoming Montana belt or the interior uh, coal mining. Um, so I just bring that up. Uh, I, I know the people in, in Kentucky and West Virginia are, and Pennsylvania are so aware of this, Western Pennsylvania, uh, but, I, but when you're speaking to a conservative audience, you need to be uh, making sure that you bring that messaging in of equal empathy for the people who are, whose jobs are going away from the, from the children and, and future generations who we're trying to protect. Um, I would just direct you to one other, actually, I would direct you to a couple things. There's some very good talks on the science and technology side in today's conference. You'll be getting links to the, to the uh, other talks. If you haven't been watching the science and technology talks, there's some interesting talks there on optimistic future of our energy. Uh, you can also go to the June 2020 conference that we held this year, and Shannon Carraway, who is the vice president for a solar company, used to be at a, at a senior level in the largest utility uh, providing energy to the to the secret state of Texas, uh, provided a talk called An Optimistic Vision of Our Energy Future that goes much more uh, in depth and a little different angles into this that I would encourage you as a resource that you could tie back onto. Um, so the second piece I want to talk about is crafting your message to connect with your audience. And I want to just give a few resources and a few thoughts on this. Um, for the Southeast, uh, uh, there is a fantastic resource on uh, clean energy, uh, uh, conservatives for clean energy. Uh, the, the website is uh, cleanenergyconservatives.com. Um, this is a, a group that does state work 
specifically with a Republican audience in, in mind. They are a group of Republicans working with Republican state legislators and Republicans in, in municipal governments to try and further clean energy objectives. They do not talk about climate. Um, I would encourage you to follow the one in your state, but don't push climate change on them or don't push carbon taxes on them because that is not what they are about, respect what they are trying to do. But the arrow there, if you click on the what you believe, you get to their state. They have a little category for each state. And I just want to run through a couple of these. They have polling for each of these states there in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Um, because some of this can really help understand uh, how conservatives do think. When you go into an audience that's conservative, how might their values, how might their beliefs differ from yours? Uh, so just one of the questions, they typically have not asked climate change questions in the past and are asking them more frequently now. Um, and uh, I can't see the very top of my screen. Um, so when looking at how concerned are you about climate change, um, baseline GOP voters, this is all with, all this polling is with uh, voters, not general public. These are, this is polling for people who actually vote in elections, which is what politicians want. In addition, this is polling that's been conducted by different polling organizations in each state that poll for Republican candidates. So the pollsters, when you cite this data, are pollsters that are conservative to Republicans in that state, and they will probably recognize the name of the polling firm. Um, when you look about how concerned people are, uh, the base GOP, the, the people that are really in the, the, the party and attend the uh, party functions, um, still are about two thirds not that alarmed, but still one third alarmed. So if you are going into a extremely conservative partisan crowd, you can still expect to pick off like one in three people in the crowd that are interested. Um, it oftentimes makes a lot of sense to pull back and present something if you're presenting to a group that's friendly to the whole crowd and then go out and mingle. The mingling is the most important piece where you go and try and find the people that agree with your position and build those relationships out. Um, but the soft GOP and leaning um, the independents by far are alarmed about climate change. This data is critical to bring into your member of Congress and say, okay, to win your primary, you may need to appeal to a group of people. To win the general election, you need to bring along the moderate Republicans and your independents. Um, so this kind of data, one, is good to be bringing into your member of Congress, but also can just help you get ex expectations of what people are thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, this is more Florida. Uh, how concerned are you about climate change? Uh, I'm gonna just skip over that one. Um, Oh, I thought I was on a different, okay. Uh, so with that, it's also important, this is, some, this is another question from their Florida poll. Do you think hurricanes um, are the cause, are, have, are, are stronger now because of climate change? Um, oftentimes we post things and we just assume everybody thinks that. Hurricanes are getting stronger. We'll even just make a statement. And this polling suggests it's really important to put your evidence out there not your statements out there, but it's important to, to say, hey, here's why I think hurricanes are getting stronger um, and be able to articulate that, be able to throw some good sources out into like even just things like op-eds in your community. Um, when you're engaging conservatives, you need to make some of the connections for them as opposed to start with this idea that, oh, everybody already understands that storms are getting stronger. Um, so backing your message up a little bit can be very important. And this extends all the way into moderate Republicans. I'm gonna cover just a couple of slides from North Carolina and, and skip a couple of these in the sake of time. Um, in the North Carolina polling, a different firm did it and they present it differently. Um, so uh, do you believe that uh, climate change is causing significant change, shifts in our weather um, or, or not so much? Uh, that man's had very little impact on our weather patterns and they kind of phrase the answer as a real, climate change is real, climate change is not so real, the impacts are not so real. And they break it down by Republicans and the unaffiliated is really important. In North Carolina, something that the candidates look at and that, and that these people bring to their members of Congress that's important for us to bring to our members of Congress. How long has somebody been in the state? North Carolina's population is growing because people are immigrating into North Carolina, not because North Carolinians are uh, having more kids. 
Uh, so this, the, the, on the right side, the red circle that, that, uh, that uh, Conservatives for Clean Energy did, the fact that people have lived in North Carolina for shorter periods of time believe this more is a trend of where the Republican Party needs to go to pick up the voters that are moving into North Carolina. It is a very powerful message um, when you're talking to your member of Congress. And I'm going to skip over those. Referencing, so engaging with um, people who uh, share the values of your audience. I really encourage people to use the economist statement for, for carbon dividends. The 15 former chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors who signed this um, were selected by the last, uh, what is it, six, six presidents uh, to be their advisors. So this not only includes uh, President Obama and President Clinton, but it also includes former President Bush's advisors, H.W. Uh, Bush's, former President W. Bush's, former President Reagan's Bush's, and one of former President Ford's advisors. Um, that is a very strong message to bring in there. Oh, I'm having trouble loading here. There's also a resource on community um, that will break down. There are now 3,500 economists that have signed that. Um, and I'm, let me see if I can just show the part that will show. Yes. So the economist in your state, there's a spreadsheet that, that you can uh, find the link to if you download the slides. And uh, this is the number of university economists that have endorsed that statement in your state. Um, and when you, when you are talking to a member of Congress that has an alma mater in your state, you can pull up the economists from his alma mater. These are people you can go to to try and help um, engage your member of Congress. Um, and the individual list of all of those member, all of those economists is on the link that you can get with these slides. Oh, this is getting annoying. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'll skip that. Craft your message. Uh, so that was crafting your message. Um, make sure that the message that you're crafting relates to other conservatives um, and, and yeah. I'm, I'm going to focus just a minute on state teams and then uh, oh, just have a minute or two for questions. One of the things we are really trying to do right now is form state teams and my slides just are suddenly not loading. Um, so in the southeast, I apologize for this, in the southeast, um, we are across the country, we are trying to get state teams focusing on doing conservative outreach at a local level. Uh, where the state teams can get together and, and create a lot more focused strategy on uh, who are we reaching, who are the conservative voices we have, what support do we have, uh, do we want to table at the state GOP convention, and for instance, we've tabled at the state GOP conventions in California, Utah, and Texas, and Colorado. Uh, we applied this year in North Carolina, but they, with COVID, it got canceled. Um, and right now, we have state teams in the southeast in, um, actually, I think it's on this one. Yes, in Virginia, Cindy Burbank is leading a state team in Virginia. North Carolina's Dan Oldman. Uh, Tennessee, we are starting one up and I am going to host a couple of calls. Um, and Florida, is uh, we have a, a state team with a call next week, August 31st. Uh, and if you are in those states and you are interested in joining a team that is specifically focused on conservative outreach and how can we do this in that state, these are the e people you need to contact and these are the, their emails and you can ask to, to say, ex email them and say, I would love to help out, uh, please put me on your list. Um, if you are in, in a different state and you're interested in forming a team around your state or exploring what that might look like, you can email me at the, the email there, james.talbert at Citizens Climate. Uh, we currently have 11 functioning teams. Uh, we have Tennessee that we're starting up, and we also have the Great Lakes region. Uh, John Sabin is holding a call with the entire region, kind of five states in one. Um, so I would encourage you uh, yeah, to consider that is, that is one of the higher priorities we have for the year, is trying to get functional teams uh, with, with a position that we, we call a conservative state lead, which these folks are filling, uh, that are coordinating those state teams. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness. None of these are loading. I'm not sure what happened here. <laughs> so if you go to the Conservative Caucus Action Team on Community, um, so if you go to Community and click on the top, connect with others, 
look for action teams and click for the Conservative Caucus Action Team. And on that page in the center column, there's a bunch of information that can help you with conservative outreach. Um, and on the very bottom is a link for presentations and you can download these slides. Uh, if you click the link for presentations at that point, uh, then go into the folder for regional conferences, you will find the slides for this presentation. You can actually see the, the graphics I was gonna be talking off from, uh, from any of these slides. I apologize for that. Um, and yeah, all right. Uh, all right, I am gonna, I tell you what, I'm just gonna stop my share because this is not that useful. Andrea, any, I think we have just a few minutes here. Yeah, um, people are um, really encouraged by this great information and the resources that you're sharing. Um, and one of the first questions they have is, can we, we know we're having some issues with the slides, but, but is there a way to get the slides sent to them? Are you okay with that? I think you, you said oh, more. Yeah. I'm fine. I just gave, yeah. I just expressed how to, there's a, you can go download them right now at, in okay. the Conservative Caucus for the presentations folder. I'll post a link to that in a second. Okay. Great. Um, and then what specific wording or phrases can people use um, in helping to get a meeting with a representative or a businessman specifically? Are there any like key yeah, so phrases? For a, yeah, so for if it's a, I'm assuming like a Republican local, like a Republican county commissioner or a Republican legislator, um, if you if you can find another conservative to walk in with you, I think it's really helpful to say to play a conservative card and say, hey, I'm you know I really want to see the Republican Party succeed, and I'm interested. I I'd just like to share some of your ideas and hear your your thoughts on um, how clean energy can play out in our economy and how we can can assure that the the party is successful uh, over the next ten years when we need to be addressing climate change. Um, and start a little bit back from saying, I want to talk to you about a carbon tax. Um, if, yeah, it, it pick, another one is to pick a clean energy topic in your, in your state or your whatever, whatever legislative area the person is, county, if it's county commissioner, and find a reason to talk to them about it. So like the state of North Carolina, try and set up a meeting with your state Republican legislators about the offshore wind potential that we have and, and then expand that conversation into why do you think it's so critical that we're exploring this huge economic opportunity that the state of North Carolina has. Um, so Lincoln there, uh, businesses, yeah, I, I think businesses are very similar. Find, find, the, find, the, we, find that risk category for your business on why climate change could impact them, I think is, is huge. Um, and like, are, like listen for a long time to say, I, just, I even wanna understand, how are these climate risks playing out for you? And walk in and ask them, is your supply chain affected? Are your markets affected? Are your customers affected? Um, and listen for where their pain thresholds may come up. Um, and then be able to articulate the climate risks in their exact location, whether, low, so the mountains of North Carolina, high rain events that cause landslides can be a very real issue um, in this area, more than sea level rise, like in Asheville, going into a local business owner and talking about sea level rise is obviously not too productive. Yeah, great. Okay, and then I'm gonna kind of try to stream a couple themes of questions I'm getting. Um, if you could speak to um, just essentially, there's some debate um, in the conservative community around the minimal app impact that the United States is having in comparison to other countries such as China or India, or maybe just speaking about um, addressing that um, our international competitiveness, sometimes that comes up as well. Um, and so how would you suggest addressing those type of issues? Yeah, so I, I, I usually go at it from two angles. Um, one of them is, is uh, stress the, the importance of the United States having developing our own legitimate climate policy where we are gonna shift away from using fossil fuels so that we can participate in and lead in the negotiations in international communities, that we have to be at the table, participating and leading in those discussions. And to do that, we don't want the world to tell us how we're going to address it. We wanna have a rational policy that we've decided ourselves. The second piece I go to really quickly is per capita emissions and, and just know those off the back of your hand. The US emits about 17 tons per person, like you and I each are responsible for about 17 tons of CO2 per year. In China, that's more like seven tons a year. So people that say China's emitting more, of course they are. They have a lot more people. That's like saying 
um, you know, the city of Lansing, Michigan, emits less than the state of Texas. Um, it's kind of an obvious statement. Uh, so I go immediately to per capita. India, which people often bring up in that statement for some odd reason, only emits like 1.3 tons of CO2 per person per year, like literally 10 times less than we do per person. Hey, Jim, we have uh, less than a minute left. Any, um, any final thoughts you want to wrap it up with? No, I would just encourage if you are at all interested in, in participating in or, or starting up a state team, uh, we really are trying to put some resources out on that. We have a, a, the state leads now have a, uh, a call that they, part, that they talk to each other on, and we're really looking to uh, use that as a tool to strengthen how we're reaching conservatives across the country. Okay, thank you very much. And we're gonna go on pause here uh, while we wait for the next topic. Thanks, Jim.